Hello, my name is Dave Emery, and this is Side One of For the Record Program Number 711, Interview with Russ Baker, author of Family of Secrets. And it is my pleasure and privilege to bring to our airwaves, uh, not for the, for the last time, I hope, Russ Baker, the author of Family of Secrets, out in soft cover now by Bloomsbury Press. Russ, welcome to our airwaves. Thank you very much, Dave. Great to be here. May I uh, mention the subtitle of the book? Sure, please. Uh, it's The Bush Dynasty, America's Invisible Government, and the Hidden History of the Last 50 Years. Very good. And we're going to do what we can, what you've already done a magnificent job of doing, to uh, take to boost into view that hidden history, or as much of it as we reasonably can on the air, and uh, as much as you could in uh, an almost 500-page book. I'd like to begin this interview with something that you talked about in the afterward of your book, and that is the professional stigma, and a very powerful stigma it is, that attaches to someone that investigates some of the things that you have looked into, including, for example, the Kennedy assassination, another major conspiratorial event inextricably linked with the Kennedy assassination, Watergate, and other things. And you mentioned that some of your esteemed professional associates, people who had actually assisted you with parts of the research, but who also invade to an extent, perhaps gently, against going forward past a point. And, and I think you, you wrestle, you bring up the issue of investigative reporting versus, quote, conspiracy theory as it is uh, conceptualized or as, as it is stigmatized. Uh, develop that for us, if you would, and then I, I, have a, 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 I have my own afterward to that thought. Go ahead. Sure, and I, if I may just back up for a moment, uh, I, I think it's important at the outset for anyone who may not be familiar with Family of Secrets to explain that this was a, a, an authentic inquiry into a very simple, broad question uh, to which I did not know the answer. And that was, how did somebody like George W. Bush get to the top and do the things that he did? Uh, and I was genuinely curious about that. And I didn't know what I would find, if I would find anything, if there were any uh, more profound explanations than we'd already uh, been privy to, and this uh, led me into a five-year odyssey, which led me in all kinds of directions that I know you're going to be going into. And I wanted to just say that to con uh, contextualize these conversations, because people obviously hearing the subtitle about the Bushes say, well, why would you be talking about the Kennedy assassination? And of course, uh, when I began this research, I, I there would have been no reason to do it. But I started following trails. I started trying to understand uh, who George W. Bush was and then larger questions about his family and their rise to power and the circles which, with which they were associated. And this led me into these very much sort of dark alleys and down rabbit holes uh, where I began having to kind of uh, analyze and rethink uh, whole portions of American history. And so, so that's the backstory. Now, as to the the issue you raise of of concern about going into certain topics, uh, I think that all of us in the mainstream media, and I sort of have always straddled the line between what you'd call mainstream media and alternative media, uh, we're always aware, sort of at least in the back of our mind, that there are topics that when you begin talking about them, right away you have problems. You have professional problems. You have problems being dismissed uh, by certain, uh, let's say, critics, uh, by some portions of the public. Uh, and that really relates to this notion of whether or not there are larger causations, whether or not there are larger networks of influence and of power that shape events. Uh, and, and as you, I'm sure you know, David, I know you, you talk about and you look into these things, the United States has very much a notion of itself which is somewhat idealized. And that is that although we know that all these terrible things go on in the rest of the world, and although we know that even our own country has been deeply involved in many of these things, and even, uh, even the sponsor of so many of them, they're all documented in testimony and hearings and all sorts of confessionals, we still have trouble believing that any of those kind of awful things could also take place uh, on, on home ground. And that really is where, uh, when you begin exploring those possibilities, you encounter a tremendous amount of resistance and a tremendous amount of cognitive dissonance from Americans of all kinds. Uh, one of the interesting things about the issues that you have dealt with very successfully, you've already brought up a word I'm going to touch on in a second, but when 
one brings up the topic or, or, or usher, utters the phrase conspiracy theory, right away it, it is so stigmatized and it causes a rolling of the eyes. And in many ways, from a professional standpoint, it is psycho, sociologically fascistic in the sense of there, is a, 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 there are the twin fundaments of inclusion or exclusion. And if you want to make it professionally, uh, you cannot talk about, quote, conspiracy theory because one is automatically excluded. And it, in some ways it's almost adolescent. And it, it's like, you know, the, 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 the young man or young woman who's not good to associate with because they're not dating or whatever, or they have the wrong physiological type, or even juvenile where we can't play with Johnny or we can't play with Janie because they have cooties. And, and, and it's really very powerful. And I don't think that people who decline to joust with the dragon that you have slain, and I think you've done a good job, uh, I don't think they are to be faulted past a point. I, on the other hand, long ago chose to wear the scarlet letter of conspiracy theorist, and, and believe me, you know, to coin a phrase, you don't get paid and you don't get laid. <laughs> so it's not a lot of fun. What you have done in a very, very good way, a remarkable way, is to illustrate what I think it is all about. If one avoids the term conspiracy theory and uses another term, which you have illustrated uh, abundantly, and that is networking, has a very different stigma to it, a very different connotation, and one that is not negative, and one that I think really goes to the substance of your book, Family of Secrets. When you talk about the, fam the Bush family as the family of secrets, when one talks about the subtitle of your book, The Bush Dynasty, America's Invisible Government, and the hidden history of the last 50 years, I don't think there is anything that you have illustrated more profoundly than networking. And when you ask the question, how did W come to be? How did Bush happen? He happened because of networking, networking between the intelligence community and the political establishment, and in turn the corporate establishment, the, the all business, as they say in Texas in particular. And so uh, kudos to you, because uh, rather than... Uh, uh, a conspiracy theorist, I would classify you as a networking theorist, and uh, you've done a whole lot more than just theorize, and you deserve a lot of credit for it. Well, I, I actually, I mean, I, I pride myself on the fact that the bulk of my work over the quarter century that I've been doing journalism, and, and particularly investigative journalism, is driven almost entirely by documented facts. And, and this, I think, distinguishes my work from that of many other people. Uh, a lot of folks have trouble understanding the difference, that the, the difference between uh, opinion and, and, and conclusion and simply laying out things that are not in dispute but are, have never been laid out together or are not well known. And so with Family of Secrets, I just started encountering the most extraordinary facts. And these were things that were uh, admissions by the people themselves in little-known, uh, privately uh, published memoirs. Uh, these were transcripts of conversations. They were documents that had long remained hidden and then been perhaps accidentally declassified. Uh, they were a matter of connecting dots between lots of uh, circumstances that themselves didn't seem that interesting. Uh, and, so, and so when you do that, what you do is you, 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 you end up with some sort of picture begins to appear from all these dots. And that's where, when you're talking about theory of some sort, is, you know, the reader starts saying, okay, now tell me what this means or what do you think it means. And so what I do in Family of Secrets is I, I create these narratives, and I, and I work pretty hard to try to weave it into a kind of a, a, a dramatic, uh, almost like a spy story. Somebody called it Ludlam on steroids. Uh, you know, just a very lively narrative rendition of people doing something in a plot building. But it's made up of these thousands of data points. And then every so often I stop and I say, okay, what do we have here? What do we think this means? Could it mean this? Could it mean that? It certainly seems to mean something. And I, I try very hard not to go too much beyond that and let the reader uh, come to their own conclusions. Russ Baker, in your book, Family of Secrets, again, for listeners who may have just tuned in, subtitled The Bush Dynasty, America's Invisible Government, and the Hidden History of the Last 50 Years, you illustrate networks, and the Bush family uh, for generations 
have been both uh, beneficiaries of these networks and also people who advance the causes of these networks in a fundamental way. Let's go back to the early part of the last century, Russ, and let's talk about some of the, well, what C. Wright Mills referred to as the power elite. Let's talk about the Harriman family. Let's talk about the Walkers, and let's talk about the Bushes and how they began to network coming out of the Gilded Age and going into World War I. Tell us a little bit about some of these families. Uh, again, Walkers, uh, Harrimans. The Dulleses, the Rockefellers, the Morgans. Uh, you know, we know about these families. If we read books, we see there are these huge histories of these families. But most of those books don't really go into the subterranean element. Uh, but, you know, the way you start seeing it is I went back, as I always do when I do this sort of research, and I did a lot of historical digging into, for example, uh, newspaper clippings, and you see who's staying at whose house, who are all together uh, uh, for dinner at a, and sitting at a particular table together in Palm Beach, who are all together at, at a wedding who are sitting on the board of directors of a particular bank and a, a particular charity and so forth, who, who are intermarrying, who are swapping blocks of stock. And so you start seeing these connections, and you start understanding who knows who and who works with who. And this is really the key thing, because if we examine our own lives, that's how we get things done. We meet people. We perhaps meet our, our future significant others through usually networks, meaning work networks or play networks or familial networks. That's how most of these things happen. Or other networks. Now it's uh, online dating, but that's a network. Or Facebook is a network. And so these people are the masters of networks. They were, they were networking long before the rest of us ever even thought of the concept. And so, and so the Bushes are very interesting because they're not the top of the network. They're very much the sort of the worker bees almost of the network. They're people who were comfortable but who really work as kind of officers for these titans. And so if you go all the way back, you see the Harrimans, of course, E.H. Harriman uh, being a great uh, railroad tycoon. And then he dies, uh, and his sons, who are very young, Averill and Roland Harriman, inherit this whole thing and they've got this great fortune now and they want to diversify it they go off to Yale and at Yale they join a secret society called Skull and Bones and in Skull and Bones is a fellow named Prescott Bush now he's from a family that is connected but is on a lower level his his father was uh, Samuel Bush uh, was uh, in the railroad business but at a lower level but the father got to know Rockefellers and Harrimans and so forth uh, manufacturing railroad equipment and uh, at, uh, at the start of World War I uh, Samuel Bush, so you talk about the great grandfather of W, uh, was appointed through his more powerful friends to be in charge of small arms procurement for the war effort, uh, then a lot of that business went to companies like Remington Arms, which were again owned by uh, big blocks of stock owned by people like the Rockefeller family and what have you. And then uh, brothers of theirs were in the railroad business employing Samuel and so forth. So you see this, this pattern of, of them being sort of retainers. And then you see intermarriage. And so uh, Prescott Bush uh, is in Yale. He's in Skull and Bones with these Harriman sons. Uh, and then they graduate, and he marries, very interesting story there, a whole separate tale, he marries uh, a man named George Herbert Walker, who is one of the largest um, financiers and bankers and investment bankers and stockbrokers uh, outside of the East Coast, outside of Wall Street. It's located in St. Louis. And this guy is, is huge. Even though he's never, he's almost forgotten today, he was doing business all over the world. So he marries this guy's daughter, and then the, his buddies, the Harriman boys, uh, draft George Herbert Walker to move to New York and to take over the running of all of their investments. And so begins this whole new enterprise that eventually becomes the investment banking firm of Brown Brothers Harriman, an outfit with uh, interests all over the world uh, that was before that company was constituted in its final form, uh, was relying on the U.S. government and the U.S. military very much to protect their assets. Uh, the Marines would go into places like Nicaragua and what have you uh, to push out uh, uh, presidents who were not doing their bidding. And so you begin to see the outlines of this sort of interventionist policy in, uh, in the service of uh, private wealth that controls natural resources all over the world, uh, a, a situation that continues 
to the very present moment. There's a famous quote by General Smedley Butler, a, two, a Marine general and two-time winner of the Congressional Medal of Honor. And in fact, he was testifying before Congress and uh, about testifying about, among other things, uh, his recruitment by some of these power brokers to try to overthrow Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And he, he said, basically, he was a highly described himself as a highly paid gangster for various corporate interests on Wall Street. And he specifically mentioned Brown Brothers Harriman by name. And uh, Walker is a powerful family. Uh, maybe one of the only things that we see today carrying the Walker name is the Walker Cup. You mentioned that uh, George Herbert Walker was instrumental in bringing the game of golf to the United States, the, uh, the preferred sport of the power elite. One of the things, by the way, we are interviewing, if you've just joined us, we're interviewing Russ Baker, the author of the remarkable book, Family of Secrets, subtitled The Bush Dynasty, America's Invisible Government, and the Hidden History of the Last 50 Years. And one of the things, uh, one of the aspects of networking that you illustrate in a very compelling fashion, and that is the relationship between uh, national security matters, political matters, and again, the all business. Now, uh, the Harrimans spawned a company which will figure very prominently in uh, the investigation that you have uh, downloaded in uh, Family of Secrets and that we'll be talking about in future interviews. Uh, tell us about Brown Brothers and how they spawned Dresser Industries. Right. Well, that's a, that's a whole other story we could do a show on. But basically, uh, in a lot of cases, what they were doing was they were taking over other companies that had some kind of a monopoly. And uh, Dresser Industries was a company that got in the in the 19th century got into the petroleum business very very early on, providing uh, crucial non oil drilling services. Uh, uh, couplers for, uh, for, for, for pipelines and, 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 uh, uh, things that you needed in order to be able to secure, uh, uh, your wells and so forth. The same thing, uh, actually, uh, that they are still doing. There were a number of different mergers and things under the name Halliburton today and and this is uh talk about what's in the news the uh, the blowout uh, of the uh, the BP platform uh in the in the Gulf of Mexico one of the companies in there uh, Halliburton and and so so Dresser uh mer- would later on merge with several different companies Halliburton and uh, with uh, Bra- uh Brown and Root uh, another very very important firm an engineering firm that is is also known as with the division as KBR, and they're one of the biggest defense contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, so what what was going on a uh, hundred years ago uh, is still very much going on today. Uh, we don't talk about these things; we don't understand them, and unfortunately, we in the media tend not to cover them. Uh, Dresser Industries uh, was a, a spinoff, so to speak, and we should uh, we should uh, note that Prescott Bush. Uh, went to work for Brown Brothers Harriman. And you mentioned that one of the Harrimans, I think it was E. Roland Harriman, uh, sort of pointed to a fellow and said, Dresser Industries, or Dresser. And uh, that was a fellow who, I don't know if one could I, I actually describe him as the godfather, perhaps not in a strict sense, but uh, maybe in, in a corporate-slash-generational sense, the, uh, the professional godfather of George Herbert Walker Bush, and that is a fellow named Henry Neal Mallon. Tell us a little bit about Henry Neal Mallon and Dresser Industries. Right. Well, he was another one of these uh, friends from Yale, and uh, with all of them, by the way, have these sort of murky periods in their in their resumes where they, in the case of Mallon, he purportedly went off for a while uh, climbing in the Alps. They're basically blank spots on their on their resumes, and then they resurface and suddenly appointed to these important positions. Um, uh, you know, and Mallon again, you know, the, the skull and bones tie. So he he comes back from this trip and he comes in to visit his buddies, the Harrimans and and Prescott. And according to this story, they're all sitting around deciding what to do with this Dresser Industries company that they had just bought. Uh, when they he, they spotted him, he walked in the door and immediately, as you point out, Roland said, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dresser, Dresser, you know, and that this guy could run Dresser. And so they take this fellow with really, uh, really lacking the qualifications to run that company, and he's put in charge of it. Dresser begins growing very, very rapidly, and in the buildup to uh, World War II and the uh, the conversion of the economy to a wartime economy, all of these, a lot of these manufacturing companies started gearing up to get military contracts. Dresser began gobbling up lots of these 
firms uh, and in Family of Secrets, I tell this story because this gets us into the early days of George H.W. Bush, uh, or his nickname Poppy, uh, who was the the, uh, the 41st president of the United States. R- Russ Baker, let me interrupt briefly. Yeah. What What is the genesis of that nickname? I know he got it, I think, at Andover, maybe Yale. What, I've never heard about the, anything about how that... Uh, no, it was, it, it was because his name was the same uh, as his maternal grandfather, George Herbert Walker. They called him Pop. And they and so they he also looked like him and as a child and so the other kids started calling him Poppy. Okay, I've never heard that discussed. Go ahead, uh, Dresser Industries and the young George, the young, the young Poppy. Yeah, and so and so he you know he goes off to Yale and 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 he goes into again Skull and Bones. Uh, and I just want to stop for a second to say that because, of course, we could do a whole program just on that. What are these entities? What are these secret societies? Well, you know, there's all sorts of irresponsible speculation on the Internet. There are a number of pretty bad books out there that are selling extremely well that purport to offer the inside secrets. And all I can say is uh, it's enough for me that the people who joined them considered them to be important enough to join and important enough to preserve whatever secrecy they were sworn to. And, and if you flash forward to the 2004 election, you have George W. Bush, uh, also a member of Skull and Bones, the Republican nominee, the Democratic nominee, John Kerry, also a member of Skull and Bones. And you have to keep in mind that it, it, it's just a handful of people in there each year. Uh, and so it's a very small and select group. Uh, in any case, so all these guys are in this organization. Uh, they all, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them seem to have familial connections to the intelligence apparatus of the United States. And by the way, that apparatus far predates the CIA because there were always spies. Every every empire uh, has spies, and uh, we had spies, you know, back in the Revolutionary War, uh, and then throughout much of the history of the country, the, the principal uh, mechanism for international spying was. Well, to some extent, it was diplomats and, and private business people, uh, but it was also the Navy and naval intelligence. And if you look at the Bush family, they served in naval intelligence. Uh, and so all these people then go into these, these elite uh, schools like Yale and so forth, into these uh, secret societies, and then they emerge from them into training in the, their various so-called family businesses. And in the case of George H.W. will call him Poppy Bush. He joins, as you pointed out, Dresser Industries, which is now uh, uh, basically owned by and run by uh, their company, Brown Brothers Harriman. He goes in there and he supposedly is doing low-level uh, things of painting fences and being a salesman and so on. But as I point out in Family of Secrets, it looks to be cover for some kind of intelligence training. And uh, very quickly you see him doing things that, that, that suggest that. Uh, including shepherding people from the East Block uh, who've come out there uh, for a visit. Uh, he disappears for periods of time and so forth. And then he starts his own company, uh, a little oil company out in, in West Texas, a very unimportant little known company, uh, which miraculously begins to have huge amounts of money being pumped in by figures in Washington, uh, like Mr. Graham, the owner of the Washington Post. And that's a whole other story about the, the connections between those powerful media families and this intelligence oil financial establishment. Uh, there's a book that complements yours, and in fact, you, uh, in Family of Secrets, Russ Baker, you actually uh, footnoted a couple of times, and I think for people that would not would like to gain some depth, after they've bought and read Family of Secrets, uh, check out a book called The Old Boys by Burton Hearst, subtitled The American Elite and the Origins of the CIA, because I think it not only illustrates networking, again, not conspiracy theory, but networking to a very uh, fine extent, it also shows how these networks in the intelligence community, one talks about a spot network or an espionage network, how they work in conjunction with powerful corporate elements of the American power elite. Uh, Skull and Bones, just I want to touch briefly on Skull and Bones. It has been stigmatized in some of the worst ways uh, by the conspiracy milieu. It's just one of a number of uh, power centers that the power elite, as C. Wright Mills call it, use for networking. You also have the supper clubs at uh, Princeton. Uh, the American power elite and the Bushes epitomize that in, in many ways are, are Episcopalian. There's a very fine book, another one people can use, called uh, The Power of Their Glory. It's by a couple of uh, authors. Their last names are Conaliga, K-O-N-O-L-I-G-E. And uh, two other things very quickly. You touched on uh, Halberton and the fact that they absorbed Dresser Industries and that they were involved with the blowout of the oil rig. 
in uh, the uh, Gulf of Mexico. Another company that you talk about networking with the Bushes, networking with George W. Bush, networking with Tony Blair, the Gamel family. Am I pronouncing that right? Not as Brit- Gamel. Uh, British Petroleum. I don't know if we'll have time to get into that, but BP is part of this networking as well. Last point, uh, a lot of people wonder about naval intelligence and why it's so important. Uh, once upon a time, uh, sail was the main vehicle for not only transportation and shipping, literally, but also communication between continents, and much of the primacy of uh, naval intelligence in the Navy in these matters stems from that. Uh, jumping back to uh, George Bush in the Navy, you mentioned that he was involved with a photo reconnaissance group, so that even when he was in the Navy, he was involved with intelligence. So highlight that for us, if you would, Russ. Right. I mean, this is the early training. In other words, uh, uh, in the uh, books, you see, Family of Secrets is, has only been even heard of by a certain select group of people because, I mean, frankly, uh, the revelations in there are, I'm, I'm afraid, a little bit too provocative for mainstream reviewers, uh, for the lo- some of the large television shows and so on. And I've been told that privately by them, They're saying, we love you, we know your credentials, but, you know, I've got to keep my job. And, and so what they do instead is they have people on there, like, you know, Carl Rove talking about his book, uh, very mainstream historians with theirs and so on. And these mainstream accounts, for example, let's say about the life of Poppy Bush, George H.W. Bush, 41, uh, is that, uh, you know, he as a, he was one of the youngest people who enlisted, you know, voluntarily in World War II and became, uh, you know, a bomber pilot, uh, you know, leaving out really, not really looking at what he did, which was that he got into uh, intelligence work, and he was doing, as you say, the, the aerial surveillance. This was uh, top secret classified work. Uh, uh, he was involved with a group of people that were connected to uh, uh, they were connected into uh, the operation in Asia. That's where he was uh, with General MacArthur, who had his own intelligence force, the OSS, which we think of as the prime, uh, you know, uh, military intelligence entity uh, in in World War II, uh, was operating mostly, in, but not exclusively, in Europe. That MacArthur basically told them to stay out, and there was a back relationship between MacArthur again and all of these people. Uh, as I relate in Family of Secrets. Uh, 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 if you go far enough back, uh, uh, um, let me see if I have this right. MacArthur's father was a governor of the uh, of the basically what was then a colony, the Philippines, uh, when the United States was extracting tremendous amounts of natural resources out of that, uh, and um, uh, and and there was a request by uh, MacArthur's mother uh, to the Harrimans, would you give our son a job? Uh, and so you see these kind of networks, again, going all the way back, tying in again to these natural resources and again to intelligence and again uh, to, to war making. Uh, Russ, and we are almost, and so on. And let, me, let me jump in. We're almost out of time on this side, but we've got another half hour to go. And uh, as I figured, we were just going to barely scratch the surface of your remarkable book. Uh, the book. Uh, at whose author we are interviewing is Family of Secrets, subtitled The Bush Dynasty, America's Invisible Government, and the Hidden History of the Last 50 Years. The author is Russ Baker. It's now out in softcover by the Bloomsbury Press. Uh, Russ, give us your website, and then we're going to move to side two. Okay, two different websites for the book. Uh, it's called it's familyofsecrets.com. Uh, and, and we don't keep it up like we should, but we occasionally put up, perhaps we'll put this, this show up there, uh, links to uh, uh, prior interviews and so forth. And then uh, another site, whowhatwhy.com, whowhatwhy.com. That is our new nonprofit investigative reporting site where we are continuing to look into these big questions of how does power work and how do these decisions get made that affect our lives as a nonprofit, and it is uh, based entirely on uh, the financial support of the public. Want to hear more? Stay tuned for Side 2 of For the Record Program number 711, interview with Russ Baker, author of Family of Secrets. This concludes Side 1. We, this is being recorded on May 23rd of the year 2010. For Russ Baker, this is Dave Emery saying thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Dave Emery, and this is Side 2 of For the Record Program number 711, interview with Russ Baker, author of Family of Secrets. This program is being recorded on May 23rd of the year 2010. Once again, it is my pleasure and privilege to bring back to our airwaves Russ Baker, the author of Family of Secrets. Russ, welcome back once again to our airwaves. 
Thanks, Dave. Uh, we were talking, let's jump right in, we were talking about uh, Douglas MacArthur and how he networked with some of the American power elite, as C. Wright Mills called it. And uh, let, let's, uh, let's talk about Poppy and the Photo Reconnaissance Group of Naval Intelligence. Well, I mean, essentially what you had was uh, Poppy or George H. W. Bush, the uh, 41st President of the United States, uh, uh, leaving uh, his prep school and going right into uh, into uh, flight as a as a as a naval uh, bomber uh, pilot and also in very much involved with this uh, top secret naval reconnaissance work. This was very very important, uh, and these were precursors of. Uh, you know, elements like the CIA that would emerge after the war. And so he was already being trained in intelligence work. Uh, a, a big part, by the way, of Family of Secrets, at least the first half, is about what I discovered as a secret life of Poppy Bush, that uh, he had a, a life that has never been reported on, that is not in uh, his memoirs or not in any books, uh, about him, and that is that uh, uh, long before he became the CIA director in 1976, uh, by the way, he was appointed by Gerald Ford, and at the time, if you go back and look at the, the clippings, uh, the, the, the media were sort of scratching their heads, saying, oh, I wonder why this guy is CIA director, but they don't scratch their heads very extensively, they don't really look that deeply in any of these things, so they said, well, he was a you know, young congressman up and coming, and uh, likable, and seemed to be clean and so on, and the, the CIA was embroiled in scandal, and so, well, they, they put this guy in to sort of, you know, put a fresh face on there, and that was that, but I wondered about that, and I wondered about a number of other uh, clues I'd come upon, and so I began studying him, and as I studied him, I found that all of these periods prior to that, uh, his activities seemed to uh, uh, be juxtaposed with very profound American events, and uh, I hope either on this or on a future show we'll have a time to talk about this, the, all of these curiosities surrounding the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Uh, but in any case, uh, you see this going all the way back to uh, his days in World War II, and then right after the war where he begins working for uh, the family-owned Dresser Industries, where he's again doing what looks to be an intelligence type of work. He then starts his own company, uh, and as I reveal in Family of Secrets, he started uh, an offshore drilling company, a rather obscure one, with uh, quite a bit of money from uh, interested parties in Washington and uh, with uh, the help of a man who was himself a young CIA officer who purportedly resigned from the agency in order to join Mr. Bush uh, in the offshore drilling business. Uh, and then you begin to see them putting rigs uh, in strategic locations like just right off of Cuba uh, prior to the Bay of Pigs invasion. Now, was that Thomas Devine? Yes. Okay. Uh, again, an individual, and when you interviewed him, he had some very interesting things to say about your methodology. And I, not a person I would want to sit down and talk to face to face in a bit, in a mini editorial contribution. Uh, more about Zapata Petroleum. And again, what, the Kennedy assassination is something we can probably. I, it, it was what started me on my life's work, looking into the events of eleven twenty two sixty three and Watergate because they're inextricably linked. Uh, we can do an entire program, probably two or three, about just the Kennedy assassination. We could do one, I think, just about George de Morenshield, the oil industry, and the deep politics going back to uh, the the Russian, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, the period between the wars, and 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 the deep networking there. But talking about Zapata Petroleum, and everywhere, I want to stress that everywhere one looks with Poppy Bush, and uh, it's illustrated very dramatically in Family of Secrets. One finds the hallmarks of intelligence. Uh, Zapata Petroleum appears to have been, however much oil they did or did not drill, it appears to have been in many ways an intelligence front. Uh, develop that. And also, there's a name that is prominent in the history of the Bush family and prominent in the history of, of uh, these power networks, and that is Alan Dulles and the Dulles family. So let, let's talk about Zapata as an intelligence front. And let's talk about the Dulleses and how they figure in the Bush family narrative. Well, let me again just step back to talk about the general issue and the current relevancy of all of this. Um, you know, we're not talking about ancient history here. We're talking about continuities of power and power relationships. And, and basically nothing has changed. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency... Uh, is largely devoted, not exclusively, but it's largely devoted to providing information of use to uh, large corporate and financial interests. 
It's always been that way. The CIA was actually founded by, uh, the, or the let's say the blueprint for the CIA was created by a guy named Robert Lovett. Robert Lovett was, again, Yale, Skull and Bones, uh, a business partner with Prescott Bush in Brown Brothers Harriman. And uh, the first uh, uh, CIA director under Eisenhower, uh, not the first CIA director, there were several who were in there briefly, but the first significant one who, stay, who had a very, very long tenure was Alan Dulles. Alan Dulles, again, from a family that were connected back into the Bushes, uh, Alan Dulles uh, and, and, and his brother John Foster Dulles were attorneys with a prominent white shoe law firm that represented, and therefore they sat on the boards of such companies as United Fruit, Standard Fruit, some of these giant uh, um, um, uh, copper mining companies and what have you that were in all of these foreign countries extracting resources very, very cheaply and also putting considerable effort into putting down uh, 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 domestic uprisings where the locals we're complaining basically why are these people able to take uh, uh, you know what is our, our our birthright so cheaply pay almost nothing for it pay almost nothing in the way of taxes this is just uh, you know this is just totally wrong and so the Dulleses were very involved with that if you go back you find out that uh, uh, Alan Dulles appears to have gotten involved in intelligence back in World War one uh, and then their uh, 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 his uncle uh, was in the Wilson administration, was in his cabinet. And so, again, these families, very, very linked. Uh, the Dulles is actually, you mentioned Episcopalians, were Presbyterians, uh, and they uh, came out of another circle, which was based at Princeton. So it's another sort of a network, if you will, but they worked very well with the Bushes, and they worked very well with, uh, with, uh, with Rockefeller, uh, who was a Baptist. And so you see these different circles. You see the Harvard circle and so forth, and you see other elements. You see uh, uh, Jews and members of, of, of all kinds of different religions, Methodists and what have you, uh, Catholics certainly through uh, orders like the Knights of Malta, uh, which uh, uh, William Casey uh, later CIA director under Reagan uh, was a member of that that secret order. So all of these entities working together, very much advancing the interest of wealthy American families uh, and and powerful corporations in terms of foreign policy. And this was largely the agenda of these intelligence agencies. And of course, the public never understood this uh, because there was never much scrutiny of it. And of course, their activities are all secret and even only a few members of Congress to this day are allowed to even begin to ask any questions. And even them, even they are given a runaround. As you may recall, Nancy Pelosi complained that uh, uh, that she felt she had been tricked at these, where she was giving these briefings on, on, on policies tantamount to torture, that she really didn't understand what she was being told and she really was not being given the whole story and I think that's probably true. Uh, by the way, a couple of nomenclature, uh, elements of nomenclature. Sullivan and Cromwell, of course, is the Dulles la Law Firm. And Alan Dulles' uncle, I believe, was Robert Lansing, Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson. That's right, yeah. Uh, it, it, by the way, today, uh, the Sullivan and Cromwell firm is a general counsel for Saudi bin Laden group. Uh, the, the, you know, we, we hear about Osama bin Laden as, you know, he stigmatized in all kinds of ways. He is a member of one of the most powerful families on earth. But uh, that's, that's a subject perhaps for uh, another program or ten. Uh, let's go back to Zapata Petroleum and the curious places that uh, they turn up with with their, some of their offshore rigs. Uh, I guess one could perhaps uh, say that they, they were rigging the political landscape. Well, what's interesting with the – there was the uh, Petroleum, uh, a firm uh, started by Poppy Bush with, very interestingly, uh, two brothers named Ledke, who en ended up uh, having a company later called Pennzoil, a uh, very, very successful oil company. But the three of them started this company, little tiny company, in, in middle and Odessa, Texas, West Texas. Uh, and then uh, Poppy started this offshoot, uh, uh, Zapata Offshore, and he begins this very curious odyssey, which I describe in, in some detail in Family of Secrets. I managed to obtain enough documents where I could see him traveling around the world, and I thought, my gosh, this is a tiny, tiny company. They're, they're, they're not making any money. They're actually losing money in most years, and yet he's traveling all over the world. And, you know, they've only got a few rigs. You have to understand the way these companies work. They, they basically what they do is they get financing to, to, to get a few rigs built or, or leased or what have you, and then in turn they will lease those rigs to other companies. That's what you see with the, uh, with the blowout in the, in the uh, Gulf of, of Mexico where uh, 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 the, the drilling is for BP, but it's not 
their rig. Transocean is the firm that owns That's it. That's right. That's right. And then and then another company is doing the, the cementing and so forth. And so it's all contracted out. In any case, the pot of petroleum was really almost nothing as far as the company. And yet here's this man traveling all over the world to many, many places where they didn't seem to be doing any business, places that were landlocked, where there were no offshore drilling opportunities and no clear uh, uh, investment opportunities for them. Very, very mysterious. And so... Uh, it looks like it's cover for something else. We do see when they put rigs up, they put them in places like off of uh, the Bay of uh, off of uh, uh, off of Cuba prior to the Bay of Pigs invasion. We see them employing Cuban exiles. Uh, we see uh, them working, being hired to put those rigs there on an island uh, controlled by Howard Hughes, who had his own connections into the intelligence community, uh, and then it being leased by Gulf Oil, uh, uh, on whose board was a man named Kermit Roosevelt. I hope I'm not throwing out too many names here. No. Nope. Uh, but Kermit Roosevelt, uh, from, of course, the famous uh, Roosevelt family, he was a CIA officer who was one of the key figures in the overthrow uh, uh, president uh, Mossadegh in Iran, the democratically elected president who was threatening the interests of Tada BP. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, one of the things that you talk about too, I, I, I just was fascinated. Uh, some of these power networks travel across the congressional aisle, and conservative Democrats such as Lyndon Baines Johnson and people like. Uh, Poppy Bush and also Alan Dulles were very closely networking. Uh, one of the fascinating details, and I posted this as a food for thought, by the way, on uh, in the news and supplemental section of my website. Uh, by the way, that's SpitfireList.com. Uh, one of the uh, fascinating details, one of many fascinating points you bring up in Family of Secrets, Russ Baker, and that is... Uh, of, uh, the, the town Medellin in Colombia has become very well known in recent years for the uh, epic cocaine trafficking, that in turn overlapping the Iran-Contra affair in which Poppy Bush figures. Who was picked to head up the uh, Zapata patro offshore petroleum rig off of Medellin, Colombia? Well, actually, it's even stranger than that. What I found was, first of all, one of the, the many revelations, literally hundreds, perhaps even thousands of revelations in Family of Secrets, is a little-known, extremely close relationship between the Bushes and Lyndon Baines Johnson. And that's very, very important, not just in terms of the context of what was happening at the time that John F. Kennedy was assassinated and Lyndon Baines Johnson ascended to the throne, uh, and Poppy Bush's role on the Ways and Means Committee in creating legislation favorable to the oil industry, Johnson's connections to the oil industry, and on and on and on. Uh, but you, you, you see this actual personal friendship, very, very close, between uh, Poppy, uh, his father Prescott, and Lyndon Baines Johnson. And then you see uh, that, that Zapata uh, opens an office in Medellin. Now, I should point out that Medellin is not on the coast. If you look at the map, it's several hours from the coast. So it doesn't seem, you know, if you had an offshore drilling company, presumably, you know, there are there are cities right on the coast that that's where you would you would put your office. Or perhaps if you wanted to be in a big city, uh, you'd put it in the capital, Bogota, but they didn't. They put it in this peculiar place. And they, they, they hired a man named Manuel Bravo to run that office. Now, Manuel Bravo was a judge in a tiny county that was absolutely crucial in LBJ's uh, contested, highly contested election to the U.S. Senate. Many believe, and this has been widely written about, that LBJ basically stole that election, having some people rig it. And one of the people who uh, you, there was the issue of uh, stuffing the ballot box was Judge Manuel Bravo. And so uh, after that, you see uh, the Bushes giving him a job in this highly improbable place, in this highly improbable institution. Uh, one of the events that you link Poppy Bush to in a big way, and this we could do at least an hour, probably several, on just this aspect of your book, and that is the assassination of President Kennedy. I'd like you to, uh, in cap again, we'll, we'll cover most of this in a future program because we, we're almost halfway through this side, but uh, the George Bush of the CIA, the warning that was sent to the FBI on 11-22-63, and the question that Ted Kennedy asked at the 1988 Democratic Convention about Poppy Bush and the Iran-Contra scandal, where was George? Uh, those three points. Uh, George Bush of the CIA, Mr. Parrott, and where, in fact, was George H.W. Bush on 11-22-63? Well, that's quite a mouthful, and, and I developed that material in more than four chapters. Right of all new material related to the Kennedy assassination in Family of Secrets. So we can only begin to just just barely scratch the surface. Sure. Essentially what happened was 
uh, just just to back way up, I, I began Family of Secrets trying to understand what the phenomenon of George W. Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld and all this, this state of sort of perpetual war in the Mideast and all these other controversial things, suspensions of civil liberties, a uh, uh, constant state of sort of terror, if you will, what this all meant and the enormous amounts of money that very, very wealthy and, and savvy Americans invested in a man of clearly somewhat limited talents. They wanted him there, and I wondered why. And this, this brought me to this notion of the Bush family as being seen by these extended networks as crucial sort of soldiers on their behalf. Uh, uh, w is Father Poppy, the grandfather Prescott, the great-grandfather Samuel, and so on. And that was very revealing to me. And then I began uh, studying the relationship between W and his father, Poppy, because W would never have become president, obviously, if his father had not already been a, a, a brand name, uh, certainly couldn't have made it on his own. And so I began looking at the father, and the more I looked at the father, the more I found this secret history, and I found this explanation that when he was made CIA director in 76 as a neophyte, that that was a false story that he actually was put in as part of an ongoing cover-up of what the CIA had actually been up to, and that was because he himself was CIA prior. And I lay out the evidence of that in Family of Secrets you pointed out uh, about Zapata offshore and so forth. Uh, and so then we have him in all these years in between, in the 1960s, and what's he doing? Well, he's a private oil man, and he's getting involved in Republican Party politics. Uh, but um, I ran across this odd fact, which is how he just avoids talking about the biggest event of the 60s, the biggest event, certainly of 1963, the assassination of John F. Kennedy in Texas. Keep in mind that the elder Bush is a Texan at that point. Uh, he is actually running for political office in Texas, a uh, national political office. He's running for the U.S. Senate nomination from Texas, basically opposing the policies of John F. Kennedy. So when I look at his uh, diary, published diaries and memoirs, and I see that he has the most minute events and so on, and we get to November 63, and he just completely skips it altogether. And then I hear that he'd been interviewed and was asked just very, in a very benign sense, somebody asked him to recall uh, what happened when Kennedy was shot and how he felt about it, and they asked him, you know, to recall where he was and so on, and he just drew a blank. He could not remember where he was on November 22, 1963. And so that, of course, is such an astonishing thing for somebody who was probably about 40 years old at the time. And so I thought, boy, you know, what is that about? And I began trying to understand that. And this took me, Dave, no kidding, uh, parallel to my other research, four or five years of digging into the Kennedy assassination as it relates to just where was Poppy. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, I have to say that I am not a, what you would call a Kennedy assassination buff. Didn't really know a lot about it. Didn't have an extensive library on the topic. Didn't really have any position on it. Uh, one heard that perhaps Oswald had done it. Perhaps he had done it alone. Perhaps he hadn't. Perhaps other people involved. There are a lot of different theories out there. But generally, uh, most professional journalists stay away from the topic because it seems to be a sort of professional quick Sand. That, that's the, that's why I went into what I went into at the beginning of the interview. Continue. Yeah, and so I, you know, stayed away from it. I just didn't see any reason to get into it. But now I, I felt compelled to answer this question. And when I began trying to answer it, I, I started coming upon bits and pieces of things. And then as I started knowing what I was looking for, it gradually grew and grew and grew until it was a torrent. And at this point, I started uh, calling friends of mine, uh, including a Pulitzer Prize winner at a, at a major American newspaper, and I'd say, come to lunch, I need to talk to you. And I'd say, I'm starting to get alarmed here. I'm starting to find things that are so big and so disturbing they're way beyond even the things that I, somebody who's really been you know, very uh, tough on the system all these years, uh, that's, it's too big for me. And I would show them these things, and I'd say, you know, I think there's a reason that this guy says he can't remember where he is. He cannot say where he was. And I would show them what I had, and they would start getting scared, and they'd say, boy, you better be careful. This is dangerous stuff. And so, you know, I, I had my nightmares. I had my... Uh, panic attacks, I guess, but I, I kept persisting, and I kept looking into this, and, and I began finding all of these fascinating facts, and you alluded to a few of them. We can, we can only go into them very briefly now, and perhaps more, as you said, on a, on a future program, but basically, uh, you start finding out that 
that there were all these interesting activities on the part of Mr. Bush, on the part of a whole bunch of friends and colleagues and associates of his in the CIA, uh, in Army intelligence, uh, uh, oil industry figures, uh, uh, a powerful uh, uh, right-wing businessmen in Dallas. All these people were friends, and they were all connected. They all had a tremendous amount of anim animosity for John F. Kennedy and for the policies that he was carrying out. And this actually caused me to even rethink John Kennedy himself, because, you know, I'd heard all of these things. A lot of people described him as they said he really was no liberal. He was a, a cold warrior. He was this. He was that. But as I began looking into all these things and studying him carefully, I began to see that actually he was much more of a reformer and a risk taker uh, than I think a lot of people realize that both he and his brother were fearlessly and almost recklessly taking on simultaneously many of the major power centers in America. In other words, instead of just taking on, say, one at a time, as, as Barack Obama is doing, they were taking on everyone. They were angering the military. They were fighting with the CIA. They fired Alan Dulles. They angered Prescott Bush. They uh, were not playing ball with the oil industry. They were not playing ball with a large American multinationals, uh, with mines in foreign countries. Civil rights. Civil rights, the steel industry. Uh, they were fighting with uh, J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. Uh, organized, organized crime. Organized crime. Uh, and this goes on and on and on. They were going after everybody. I mean, if you look at it, it sort of seems either crazy or just phenomenally courageous or both. Well, and, and uh, you, you go into uh, just great length about uh, what, what Poppy Bush was doing in Dallas, Texas on November 22nd, 1963, and how he'd assembled. Uh, Russ Baker, author of Family of Secrets, subtitled The Bush Dynasty, America's Invisible Government, and the Hidden History of the Last 50 Years. Uh, we haven't, sadly, got 50 years left to cover this. I think we could probably do it if we could both live long enough and sustain our stamina. Uh, we've got uh, less than eight minutes. What I'd like to do would be, and, and, and if we have to take a pass on some of these points, let's do so and table these for future interviews because we could uh, do an awful lot of interviews, and I'd like to do many interviews in the future as staggered over time. Uh, let's take some bullet points, and perhaps that's a, an advised term under the circumstances. Uh, in his book, The Ends of Power, H.R. Haldeman described the whole Bay of Pigs thing, which is what Nixon didn't want to come out in Watergate, as a code word within the Nixon White House, uh, so the Kennedy assassination. Poppy Bush, the, the intelligence community, and Watergate. What do you have to say about that? Oh, boy. <laughs> well, this was another area where, where, despite having covered politics and done investigative reporting on power spheres for, for several decades, I didn't consider myself very expert on Watergate, and I think a lot of us kind of, if we're old enough, we vaguely remember, and of course, you know, the bad guys, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Mitchell, and what have you, uh, John Dean is this sort of a complex figure, uh, you know, who who sort of, uh, you know, kind of turned prosecution witness and blew the whistle on the thing and so on. And, you know, Woodward and Bernstein as the great journalistic heroes who brought down a an out-of-control president and so on. And, and I got into this whole thing for Family of Secrets because now I was on the trail of George H.W. Bush, Poppy Bush, or Bush 41, uh, already had established to my satisfaction that he appeared to be have involved in covert intelligence activities long before he was named CIA director and when he had a very different uh, titles, uh, congressman, oilman, uh, diplomat, and so forth. And so the, I was very interested in him. And then I followed uh, his rise, his own political rise, and I was struck by the fact that Richard Nixon uh, was very much instrumental in that. And uh, I wondered why Richard Nixon went to such lengths to help Poppy Bush, and I discovered, and I, I think we should table for a future conversation, the backstory, the secret back relationship between the Bush family and their circle, and the rise of Richard Nixon, the control of Richard Nixon, uh, how, how Richard Nixon was basically shaped and dominated by these elite interests throughout his political career until such time as he became President of the United States, and what I reveal in several chapters in Family of Secrets is that Nixon began trying to become independent. And yep. he, yeah. 
And you did, yeah, the uh, you know we're we're down to, to uh, less than five minutes now. I want to stress that that there is no way we can even begin to really do justice. We could spend uh, several interviews just about the Kennedy assassination, or just about Watergate, or just about W. Uh, let's touch briefly on Harkin Energy and how it grew out of a couple of intelligence and drug smuggling connected banks, BCCI and the uh, Nugent Hand Bank. Uh, just very briefly, if you can, and if not, we'll we'll table that for future. Okay, uh, let me just get go as general as I can here. I mean, basically. What we're looking at is is in, uh, intelligence operations are tremendously expensive, and they largely involve moving money around, huge amounts of money, billions and billions and billions of dollars that have to be all untraceable and unaccountable, uh, used for operations, used for bribery, used for all kinds of things. And so uh, they create these front companies. There are lots and lots and lots of them, hundreds of them, thousands of them, front companies or or, or, or enterprises put inside of legitimate companies for cover. Uh, and so um, this is crucial, little known, little examined. Um, I began looking at a company called Harkin Energy, which was instrumental in the rise of George W., uh, our, our most recent past president. Uh, I, this company was instrumental in uh, securing his financial future, uh, giving him some credentials, and basically taking some failing companies that he was involved with and taking them over and thereby making him appear to be a successful businessman, which was absolutely crucial uh, shortly thereafter when he began running for governor of Texas. So uh, Harkin Energy was an interesting company. Um, other journalists had looked at Harkin over the years, Time Magazine, the Wall Street Journal, and so on, and they all concluded that this was a very, very strange outfit because the, the numbers didn't make any sense. And without going into too much detail, it just didn't, it seemed to exist for some purpose other than making money uh, for shareholders. And so uh, in Family of Secrets, I go, I have a whole chapter just on Harkin, go into, you know, who were the people involved. And, uh, again, no time here, but basically they trace back to links to all of these po international power centers, the, the kleptocratic uh, uh, Philippine dictator Fernand Marcos, uh, the uh, very wealthy interests in South Africa that subjugated the black population, uh, the... Um, uh, the the uh, bloodthirsty Shah of Iran, who again stole vast amounts of money from the Iranian people, setting up the current animosities between Iran and the United States, which are seldom uh, discussed as we as we talk about whether we should be waging war with the with the theocratic regime there, uh, and 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 others, Saudis. Uh, and on and on and on. And so what was this company? Uh, right, uh, let, let, let me just jump in ever so yeah. briefly because we're, we're going to run out of time. Uh, and we, we could do many programs about Harkin Energy, as with Zapata. I guess one could say the another oil, ostensibly oil company, the holes are greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, let, we are down to less than a minute. You write about Mickey Herskowitz, a Bush family crony journalist. What did he have? What do you write about what he said George W. Bush was thinking about in the late 1990s? We've got 45 seconds left. Okay, basically, uh, Bush told him when they were writing a book together back then that the only thing he could think of that he wanted to do as president of the United States was to invade Iraq. And to start a war for you, he felt that would enable him to give him political capital, which he could then spend. Uh, we have been speaking with Russ Baker, the author of the landmark book, Family of Secrets. A lot of people are asking, it's a political election season. Well, what can I do? One of the things you can do is to buy this book, read it, and disseminate the information via talk shows and the Internet. Russ, tell us about your websites. Okay, the more important of the two would probably be who, what, why dot com. That is a nonprofit, a nonpartisan investigative reporting site where we're continuing to look into stories today, the spheres of influence that are pressing down upon President Obama uh, in the United States government as we go forward. That book is Family of Secrets. The author is Russ Baker, with whom we have been speaking. And this concludes, for the record, 711 being recorded on May 23rd of the year 2010. For Russ Baker, this is Dave Emery saying... Thanks for listening.